Hey, good morning. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. Welcome back to Open Mics with Dr. Stites. Our skin has its own immune system, its very own. It's the first line of defense against all the germs outside our body. But when a patient gets treatment for cancer or has their immune system suppressed in order to get a transplant, their skin can go through drastic changes. Today we're exploring how and why those dermatologic side effects occur and what they can mean for you. We'll also meet a patient who spent months trying to get a full body rash under control all the while getting treated for cancer. I don't even like it when I get a little skin rash. I can't imagine a full body rash and how miserable that can be. Here in the studio with us is Dr. Adela Rambi Cardonis. How did I do? I did very well. Not bad, <laughs> all right. She is the chief of the dermatology division here at the University of Kansas Health System. She's an outstanding physician, outstanding individual. We're gonna have fun talking with her. And here in a little bit, we're also going to hear from one of your patients. So. Help us first understand, when a cancer patient gets treatment like chemotherapy or immunotherapy, which are things like Prograf, Celseth, Prednisone, how can that impact the skin? So it really depends on the action of the medication. And so some, uh, some medications, for example, that specifically target cells that are also found in the skin um, will cause a rash in the skin that looks like that skin's being attacked. Uh, when you have a medication that targets the blood vessels, uh, you know that that patient's going to get bruises on their skin because their blood vessels are going to be leaky, they're not going to be happy. The patient can get spontaneous wounds on their skin, have poor wound healing. And then you have this whole class of medications called immunotherapy where it just releases the power of the immune system. And so a lot of different autoimmune conditions or immune-mediated conditions can also happen in the skin because of that. Is that the, 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 and I don't think it is, tell, tell us the difference between this and like psoriasis or eczema or all those things we think about. So with the immunotherapies, some of the reactions that actually mimic a lot of those de novo or old-fashioned skin diseases like psoriasis, autoimmune blistering diseases, or eczema. Um, that's I the think challenge. You just called me old. old <laughs> well, that's the challenge, and I, I say old-fashioned um, just to just to uh, just to you know sort of highlight the fact that the, there are diseases and these are these are patterns that we've seen before that can happen spontaneously in patients, and we don't know exactly why it happens in those patients, but we do know that in a setting where the immune system is unleashed or the stop the stop um, the stop gaps or the stop signs are released uh, and the immune system can sort of go a little wild we see that happening as well and we see that happening more frequently in patients who are getting that treatment you know it's interesting because it feels like almost all drugs are associated potentially with the skin rash when you go through and you read the side effects rash why is that it's many different ways. There's many different ways that a drug can cause a skin rash. And the thing with cancer therapy nowadays is because it's much more specific and the mechanisms are so much more sophisticated, we're seeing a wider variety and a wider range of types of skin, of skin rashes or skin reactions to these treatments. Sometimes we can link it directly to the function or the way that the drug is supposed to work. And sometimes we can link it, but not quite predict what's going to happen because the mechanism of the drug is so non, it has a non-specific or it doesn't have a specific mechanism that we can target or that we can link to a specific type of skin reaction. All right, so these can really impact folks. How severe is this on the quality of life? It varies, but it can be very severe. Uh, there are some types of skin reactions that are so severe that even if they're not a threat to the patient, uh, they impact their quality of life so much. For example, if, it, if their kind of rash affects the palms and the soles of their feet, or they can't hold on to anything, they can't walk, even if that's not a life-threatening condition, that really impacts their quality of life. And oftentimes, the chemotherapy regimen has to be adjusted or reduced. Hands, feet, that sounds perfectly miserable to me. Is mm -hmm. that, uh, I, I would guess, not being able to get up and walk around. I'm hyper enough as it is. I can't imagine if I couldn't get up and move around like that. Yeah. And of course, some patients get a widespread blistering disease, and that actually can be a very dangerous type of reaction. Right. I mean, you can start shedding your skin, right? And you get these Absolutely. really strange reactions, and then you're up in like the burn unit where we're trying to do all this aggressive skin care. Right. Sometimes that's not enough. Absolutely. And fortunately, those reactions are rare. Uh, but the tricky thing is we can't always predict who isn't going to get that kind of a reaction. Stevens Johnson syndrome. Mm -hmm. You don't want that, they don't want that, mm -hmm. I think. We're going to bring in Tamara Edwards. Tamara recently finished treatment for breast cancer. Good morning, Tamara. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being on our program because uh, I, it's, it's tremendous. I mean, when you have to fight cancer, 
fight the skin reaction from the treatment of the cancer and be on our program. Oh, that's a tough lineup right, right, right there. Talk to us a little yeah. bit about, no, go ahead. No, 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 thank you, thank you very much. All right, so um, when did you first start developing some significant skin reactions as part of your treatment? Um, pretty much from the start. I had my first chemo session mid-November and about 10 days later, my rash started to develop. Two days later, I ended up going to the ER because it had spread over a good section of my body that it had started to be a little bit alarming and my team wanted me to go get evaluated. After going yeah, to I the think... ER, go ahead. Yeah, please. After going to the ER, um, two days after that, I actually had my first meeting with Dr. Cardones. All right, so when the people saw you in the emergency room, were they were pretty concerned about you? It was kind of um, observation and curiosity, and it was kind of, we're going to prescribe you some Benadryl, and we're going to see how you do over the next couple hours on that, especially because I was at the beginning of my treatment. So it was kind of treading lightly on what we were going to do next and going next was to see Dr. Cardonas. Cardonas. Well, that, that's a that's a darn good choice. We're going to come back to that point in just a minute. Now, you shared some photos later in the treatment when your rash was getting worse. Talk to us about how that hurt or itch or how are you feeling at that point? Yeah, the photos of the rash looking terrible, it was. Um, it was the most intense itching I've ever experienced in my entire life, more so than if you've had poison ivy or, um, you know, get a bunch of chicker bites or mosquito bites. This took the cake. Uh, if you can imagine a bear in the woods against a tree, that was kind of me going around to scratch without actually scratching. There was um, one occasion that I even put oven mitts on to prevent myself from scratching. Uh, sleeping was definitely the most difficult. Um, you know, you can't control if you have an itch when you're asleep, so you're gonna wanna itch it. Um, I'm just thankful that this went on during the winter months because I don't know if I would have been able to handle it in the full fledge of the summer. Wow, that, that sounds completely miserable. And at one point in my life, I had 327 sugar bites after sitting outside by a lake on the ground when I was a young child. But I don't think that was as bad as what you had by far. And nor was oh, my several sounds of terrible. poison ivy. But when I, what, what you had is terrible because at the same time, you're thinking, how do I get my chemotherapy if it's going to do this? That had to be in your mind. Yeah. Yeah, there was definitely a time and point. Uh, those photos there where the rash is at its worst. Um, there was one treatment session that was postponed just to allow my body to kind of take a deep breath, relax, kind of hope that my skin would calm down a little bit. And uh, then we were able to progress with my next treatment. Yeah. Tommy Ways, could you predict? when the rash would occur based on when you got the treatment? Like, did you get the treatment, you know, okay, 24 hours later, I'm gonna have a tip in my rash, it's gonna be terrible. You know, timing-wise, we couldn't pinpoint it down to an exact day. It was more so like days. Uh, if it was going to happen, it would range between eight and 13 days after my chemo treatment. Um, there was even one session where I didn't get it within 10 days. I had an appointment with Dr. Cardonas. I canceled it because I had no spots on my body. I was good to go. And literally two days later, full-fledged body rash broke out on me. Wow, that's that's tough. And, and, and now your rash kind of looked better on some of those photos toward the end, but what skin treatment did you end up on? Um, you know, I by the fourth round of my treatment, we had found a way to make me feel a whole lot less miserable. Um, bear with me, I'm going to butcher the name of this, uh, but between a topical cream that was called, uh, Dr. Cardona's, feel free to correct me here, try a um, Tramcinolone, yeah. The, okay, there we go, that was the cream that I was putting on and then the uh, prednisone tablets. 
made a huge difference for me uh, during my treatment. Dr. Cardonis, is this a typical story or what's going on here? I will say that there's not one typical story just because there's so many types of skin reactions that, occur, that can occur with immunotherapy. And we try to tailor the treatment that we, uh, the treatment that we give based on the morphology or, ba or based on what it looks like. So for example, if her rash had looked like an autoimmune blistering disease, I would have probably prescribed a different set of medications and given her a different type of treatment. I do want to say that, you know, there is some data out there that suggests that people who actually get a reaction from the chemotherapy, these targeted chemotherapies, may actually have a better response, anti-cancer response, to that treatment. Oh, okay. So it's a delicate, it's a delicate balance between trying to do everything you can to control the reaction, but at the same time doing all you can to keep the patient on their chemotherapy because they need that for the cancer treatment. Yeah, and you don't want to turn that off by one of the medications you give. And and then at the same time, and, and so can we ask, it, how's your cancer side going, Tamara? Is that, how, how did that go? I, I have completed my treatment and I had surgery and of, as of oh. this moment, I beat stage three cancer. So I am right. doing pretty awesome right now. Yes, yes. I like that big smile on your face. That is, you can tell Thank you, you feel good about that. That's, that's a battle yes. one. Having <laughs> had some treatment myself and my, my family, I, you know, Godspeed and, and and good luck, and I hope that continues to Thank hold you. for you. That's great. So, Tamara, what was it like working with Dr. Cardona? She seems pretty nice here in the studio, but what's she like in the clinic? Well, how much time do we have? How long is you, your program? Cause... You go, you go, girl. <laughs> uh, Gives lots of homework. She, <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, Dr. Cardona was um, fantastic. Um, excuse me one second. Um, her level of knowledge and care um, and dedication to her field and her patients is top notch. I had a very aggressive form of breast cancer that came with a very aggressive rash and Dr. Cardonas was not gonna mess around. We were gonna be just as aggressive back with this rash, and we were, and we were successful. I cannot praise Dr. Cardonas and the dermatology department enough. I'm beyond grateful for all of their time and effort spent with me and treating me. Now that that is a great testimonial, and and we really appreciate that. Uh, we think she's pretty darn good too. She you know, she's came to us from Duke and NIH and other places, and 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 it's like she's smart or something. Yeah, she's like I said, she's a, she set the bar really really high. So there you go. <laughs> It's very kind of you to say, Tamara, but actually she did all the hard work. I didn't do anything. Oh, so she I just did all gave the hard homework. scratching is what she did. <laughs> I did all the, I, she, I gave her all the too. homework and she's yeah. the one, she and her husband were the ones who did all the hard work. It, ta it takes a team, right? So Dr. Cardenas, I, I think that you collaborate often with oncologists. I do. Um, so, uh, just like in Tamara's case, I send a message to the oncologist and say, her oncologist, and said, um, "You know, this is what I plan to do. Are you okay with it? What can I give? What you know? I don't want to interfere with her chemotherapy treatment, with her cancer treatment." And I'm also honest with them. I tell them, you know, when I see any red flags, and I'm honest with them, and I'll tell them, you know, what I think this is not a rash that you know. I usually tell them I, whether or not it's a rash that I feel that I can control, and if it's time to start looking in a different direction. Yeah. And that's really important. Well, and then that collaboration, because then you have to switch gears and switch what kind of cancer regimen you're on, what you're going to do for the skin, and hope that some skin changes don't occur with another regimen. So it gets complicated trying to make sure you balance all the goods. Absolutely. So um, let's talk, switch gears for just a moment and talk about bone marrow transplants, because in these places, this is a type of disease where you have leukemia, lymphoma, and you're getting this bone marrow transplant. It can also cause skin changes, some of it which is called graft versus host disease where the donor cells attack the host cells and that type, it can be the skin. Talk to us about that. Absolutely. So, you know, as, as you mentioned, Dr. Stites, you know, the goal of a bone marrow transplantation is to actually completely replace a defective immune system. But then you're getting an immune system from somebody else. And that's really a setup for an autoimmune disease. Graft versus host disease is a very common complication of bone marrow transplantation. It depends on where you look at. You can, um, as many as 50 to 80 percent of patients who undergo an allogeneic bone marrow transplant, meaning that they got their cells from somebody else, 
will get graft-versus-host disease. 80% of the time, the skin is affected. Um, and you can get skin acute graft-versus-host disease usually when, within the first 100 days after the transplant. That looks more like a regular uh, drug reaction or drug rash. And then you have chronic graft-versus-host disease, which occurs much later, usually after 100, uh, usually 100 days or later after the bone marrow transplantation. And that one, that type of reaction, can mimic a variety of autoimmune diseases as well. You know, back in my older days, I, I sort of remember when we had these kind of problems, and you'd say a little GVH can be good for the soul because it means you're gonna your your new bone marrow is gonna attack and kill all those can those uh, uh, cancer cells in you. Yes. Kind of what you're saying earlier. Yes, and that you want a little bit, but you don't want too much. You don't want it to go haywire because it can damage um, and can damage the body. So I follow a lot of patients who've had lung transplants and. And one of the questions would be, what kind of skin problems can people with, who have had what we call a solid organ as opposed to liquid organ, blood, um, a solid organ transplant, what kind of problems do they see? So the solid, with the solid organ transplant patients, their skin disease really revolves more around their chronic immunosuppression. So um, this is the, the effect of being chronically on medications that suppress the immune system. So you get a, a lot of patients get warts, and of course it's skin cancer and atypical infections. Those are the main things we watch out for. You know, I, I know that we really struggle with squamous cell carcinoma in the post-transplant population. And since they're on these drugs to suppress your immune system, man, that squamous cell, especially on the head and the scalp and places like that, that can be pretty brutal. Yeah, definitely. And you know what we what and we have to keep in mind that these patients are immunosuppressed. So the likelihood of getting skin cancer is higher. The likelihood of getting a complicated skin cancer is also higher. And then uh, some of our interventions have to sort of revolve around the fact that we cannot stop the immunosuppression on these patients, uh, but we can ask the, the transplant team to modulate them or to maybe to pull back a little bit, depending on how many skin cancers the patient is getting, and depending on how severe and how high risk those skin cancers are. All right. So take us to the forefront of this whole world. What are the kind of novel therapies, interventions? What's kind of Star trek -y out there? I'm, I'm a Trekkie, so you, I'm going to use it. Right. So, so the, we're looking a lot. So, so you know, we're looking a lot into um, non-toxic non, uh, non ways to try to prevent skin cancer. I will say it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of buzz about that. Um, something, for example, as simple as nicotinamide, which is a, which is a B3, vitamin B3, uh, was demonstrated. Uh, some re very good researchers in Australia before had demonstrated that if you take that, uh, that supplement, it decreases your risk of developing further non-melanoma skin cancers. And so people have been trying to look at, okay, if we give this, to patients who are immunosuppressed or are at higher risk of developing skin cancers, will we also reduce their risk of, of developing skin cancer? So sort of preventing that. Um, the data is still a little bit controversial. Um, it's not yet solid. There's a study that came out a couple of months ago uh, that sort of was not very encouraging, but they did not get to recruit as many patients that they needed to recruit to be able to answer their question. Uh, and then there are, you know, people are looking at local therapies, taking these immunotherapies, and instead of giving it systemically, directing like it, in, injecting it directly into the skin cancers. Um, so those are doing local therapies that don't mess around mm -hmm. with the immune system. Uh, there's lots of stuff that's going on with that. You know, it's interesting if we switch gears just a little bit more, and we, we have Hawkeye jump in here a little bit too. You know, our skin's really a big old petri dish, right? I mean, I think we have, we, we know we have all this gut inside our bacteria, or all these bacteria inside our gut, but really, I mean, there are a ton of microbes that live on our skin, and those microbes can actually be important for our skin. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so this is another topic that's near and dear to my heart, the skin microbiome. You know, we have a trillion organisms. It doesn't sound very nice. We have a trillion organisms on our skin. They outnumber our, our human cells 10 is to 1. And they're Did not you say 10 to 1? 10 to 1. I've always felt that number when I'm around Hawkeye. That's it. That's right. That's it. 10 to 1. And, and they're not passive. They do a lot of things. They educate our immune system. They interact with our immune system uh, and on a constant basis, teaching our immune system what to do and what not to do. They keep, they keep the bad pathogens at Bay. So we know that in situations where you're wiping out your normal skin microbiome, then the bad actors might actually take over. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are, and we do know that in certain diseases, inflammatory diseases, you don't have to have a proper infection. You just have to have an imbalance in your microbiome for there to be inflammation. So there's, it's a, there's a lot of research that's going on right now um, in terms of the skin microbiome. And, but we do know that it plays a crucial role in teaching our immune system what to do um, and also keeping homeostasis in our skin. 
you, know, you don't think about all the bacteria and how important it plays. We always think they're bad, but actually a lot of bacteria are good, Hawkeye. I mean, this is going to be music to your ears. Yeah, no, it, and it is the microbiome. I think that's the important word for people to understand. It's a, it's a symbiosis between us and the organisms that live on and inside our body, and it, they are vitally important for maintaining um, you know, balance of different things, whether it's in our in our gut or on our skin. Um, and I don't think people really know and understand that. And that is one of the reasons why we also say that, uh, you know, your, your body is constantly sampling things all of the time. You have exposure to different things. And some of those things do include those bacteria and, and the products of those bacteria. So does this mean I should just go have a good roll in the dirt from time to time so I can make sure my skin's well covered? <laughs> I don't quite know your mother would approve of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, speaking of parents, mm -hmm. we're going to say you can send in your uh, uh, dermatitis. That doesn't mean you're all parents, but a special shout out to General Cardonis, <laughs> whose daughter is in our program this morning. I don't know if the general is listening or not. This is shows are available on podcasts. Make sure you take a look at those. And I just want to make sure that General Cardonis, your daughter, you should know, she does an amazing job here at the University of Kansas Health System. We are delighted to have her. In the meantime, send in your questions to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or email the Medical News Network. Let's gonna we're gonna check the COVID cat with Doc Hawk. Yeah, yeah, Steve. You know the uh, the numbers for active infections have been lower, a little bit higher today, but overall yeah, they were really low when you were gone. I'm just gonna say we got down to two. Buddy. No, they were really two. low earlier. Yeah, okay. you were not you here. Were gone. They were down to two. <laughs> Um, 12 total, but five active, one in the ICU, zero in the ventilator. And we should st say, state also um, that uh, we did that review of the couple patients that we had um, last week or earlier this week. Again, uh, one of them was an incidental finding, but the one that was in the ICU uh, had comorbidities, had age, had a couple different other chronic conditions that led probably to that increased risk of that severe disease as well. Yeah, and hopefully a new vaccine comes out in the fall that's going to be a little more active with the, mm -hmm. against the current um, um, variants. The New York Times ran a headline this week saying, quote, a positive COVID milestone. Yeah. The total number of Americans dying each day from any cause is no longer historically abnormal or historically mm -hmm. high. Excess deaths have reached pre-pandemic levels. Yeah. Well, COVID isn't gone, but that's good news. I think that's really good news. And excess deaths, again, we know about baseline uh, deaths and mortality that we can expect in any one community in the nation. And we saw that during the time of the pandemic, those excess deaths were significantly increased. And I think we had done a couple stories or talked about it a little bit a few times uh, during the height of that pandemic. So I think this is good news. This is one more measure that we are looking at towards getting towards kind of pre-pandemic levels. And there are many of those uh, topics of, of pre-pandemic versus um, during the pandemic and now after the, the, the urgent or emergent pandemic itself. But I think overall, this is good news. We still need to continue to promote prevention and, and seeking out medical caregivers, um, getting those vaccines, getting those regular screenings. These will all help to do that as well. And of course, continue to uh, endorse uh, getting that infrastructure for public health as well. These are all little things that will add up to help also reduce those excess deaths. You know, I know one thing that will help is people put on sunscreen so they don't get skin cancer, Absolutely. die from skin cancer. Yeah. <laughs> Just a shout out for Dr. Codonis and Tamara right there because we, we, we all know that, that that is really true. Yeah. Hey, last week, U.S. lawmakers again debated the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some people yeah. are still pretty concerned. It's a lab leak. I think a couple of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, scientists or a couple of scientists were grilled pretty heavily by several of the Republicans on the panel. Yeah, I mean, I think this debate will continue to to rage on. You know, we also know that there are a lot of politically charged um, debates going on currently about many different things. This is one of them, the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic or the origin of the virus. What we would say here, Steve, is that based on the publicly available science and based on the expert uh, opinions of those people in science, uh, such as virologists, immunologists, epidemiologists, um, we do understand that the best theory out there is that the 
Uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, originated in an animal and spilled over to human population. Um, this continues to be, again, the best publicly available evidence. We know there are caveats, um, such as the earliest evidence from the earliest cases, um, some of the things that China will or will not release, but based on, again, expert opinion from virologists, epidemiologists, immunologists, and what is publicly available, uh, the best uh, theory that we have that we should continue to uh, promote at this point in time is that the pandemic did start from spillover from an animal, uh, whether it was a bat in general or an intermediate animal into humans. And of course, we also know uh, there is spillover from humans back into other animals we, as well. So we just talked about last week that yep. we're spilling into the deer, we spilled into the dogs, yeah. and SARS-CoV-2. And we have to remember, there have been a lot of bad infectious diseases in the world which have started mm -hmm. in animals and got spread to humans when they yeah. became transmissible to humans and it's you know oh, the, the, the severe influenza pandemic back in the early 1900s you just think of like, uh, the, the bubonic plague I mean, there are just so many bad diseases yeah. that we don't really have to make up another solution for this bad disease correct and when people are tempted to do that and well, i think we should know the truth and it, it could come out of the lab but at the end of the day it's not like this hasn't happened before in the history of, of humankind. Yeah, and in fact, really any, I think there's only been maybe one laboratory a leak or one or two major laboratory leaks. Um, and these were based on failure to adhere to the protocols to help protect against those things. Um, and so, you know, this is definitely, uh, we don't have any evidence to support that at this point in time. And those were very well known and worked with organisms such as smallpox or um, uh, anthrax. So um, we don't have any evidence of that at this point. All right, Alexa Stell said, our questions out there are popping off our skin today. That's kind of all right. We have some great questions for you. Gene has a question. He wants to know if something like Zyrtec would help because Gene says it basically cured his pressure urticaria. And if you could also explain what pressure urticaria is. <laughs> <laughs> You're up. So, so yes, thank you for that question. So pressure urticaria is basically a condition where you get hives after um, you have mechanical, you've experienced mechanical pressure on your skin. It can be very challenging to treat mm -hmm. because of course you can't put yourself in a bubble and keep yourself away from all, all objects on this earth. Um, so it, it just depends. So we, Zyrtec or, uh, or Cetirizin is an antihistamine uh, and it's, it's supposed to help with itching. Um, it can be helpful, but not always. Uh, for certain types of drug reactions and chemotherapy reactions, the itching is just so intense that an antihistamine is not enough to control the itching. Uh, the good thing is NIH has actually started to pay attention and in the recent years they've actually been trying to promote research on itch and we know that it's not just a simple thing it's a really it, it can be very debilitating and so there's a lot of focus on trying to figure out better ways to control itch in patients with skin disease. I think I um, that, that is a great question like go ahead. Well I have a question because I have pressure urticaria as well like Jane and I've been taking a Zyrtec a day since I was probably 19, what caused that? Is there any way to tell what causes that in a person? Chronic no. hives? We don't know. In, in some cases, in some cases, we are able to identify what triggered the hives and what the person, what the, and what was the, what's the cause. And if you avoid that, then you, you know, you, you won't get your hives anymore. But most of the time, we actually don't know what the real true underpinning cause is and we don't know what the switch was. So we have, what we tried to do is we tried to control the symptoms, but we're really not mm -hmm. getting to the root cause yet of why that happened in the first place, with pressure or to carry mm -hmm. at least. Marsha has a question. Marsha wants to know what specific chemo treatment caused this reaction for Tamara? So um, Tamara was on immunotherapy. She was on a checkpoint inhibitor. So what that class of medications does is it removes any stop sign to your immune system. So I think about the immune cells as going through roads and then there's pod signs and stop signs and yield signs. It basically mm -hmm. takes those all away. And not all, but takes the major ones away. And so your immune system can just rev up and try to combat the cancer. Um, and we don't, know, we don't know if it's just that or if it's that plus something else uh, that can trigger these reactions. Um, I have some patients, for example, who will not have a rash just after receiving their inhibitor therapy, but that 
uh, getting that therapy plus another, another trigger can induce a rash that would have been that is ten times more severe than what it would have been had it occurred not in the setting of immunotherapy. Hmm. Yen Liang wants to know if wearing lotion could help those cancer patients avoid a skin allergy. Any kind of specific topical you could put on your skin? So, you know, that's a really good question, and that applies not just to our, can our cancer patients, but to everyone in general. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, most important functions of the skin is to serve as a barrier. And we, when your skin is dry, and when your skin is, is irritated, if you look at your skin under the microscope, you can actually see small defects in the skin. And that's, uh, that's a problem because that makes you more prone to, to inflammation. Also, it makes it easier for these allergens or antigens to get, come in contact with the immune cells that are sort of surveilling or keeping watch on your skin. So in general, we do recommend that you want to make sure you keep, you keep your skin moist. Uh, you use a, a, a good moisturizer. Unfortunately, the best moistur moisturizers are the goopiest moisturizers. You're not really adding moisture back to your skin as much as you're preventing the escape of moisture. And you want to help keep that barrier intact. Okay. Jean wants a clarification. Jean writes, did you say B3 or D3 prevented non-melanoma skin cancer? So it's a B3, it's nicotinamide. Uh, nicotinamide is, is a supplement okay. and, and uh, there are some studies and your, your physician can talk to you whether or not it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, usually we recommend it in patients who've had multiple non-melanoma skin cancers. It's not, at the dose that it's given, it's not a very risky medication, but it's something that you would want to talk to your dermatologist about if it's appropriate for you or not. I have a vaccine question from Angela. This is for uh, Dr. Hawkinson and Dr. Stites. Angela wants to know, we're due for our second booster. Should we wait to get the new vaccine in September? I think a lot of it depends on how sick, what their underlying immune system's like, or otherwise health yeah. is. But uh, you know, I'm waiting for the monovalent to come out mm -hmm. because I think it's going to be a lot more effective against current circulating variants. And um, but I think if you're really, really sick, if you're really immunosuppressed, it may still be good to go ahead and get it. But clearly, you're going to want to get the monovalent come mm -hmm. September, October. Yeah, and hopefully those vaccines will be available soon. I mean, we are in the middle of July now. Typically, we see influenza vaccines even almost available in August. So I think we are not far from it. Certainly, talk with your medical care team um, and. Uh, you know, if you can wait, I would wait because it, hopefully it'll be available soon. I agree with you, Steve. But if you have symptoms before that, please get tested early. And if you can get on Paxlovid, that will always help reduce your risk as well. What if yeah, someone watching feels like they, yeah. Go, you go ahead. Go on. Okay. I was going to ask if someone watching feels like they can't wait and they want to get that booster, can, is there harm in getting both if they get the booster and then in September they go for the, the monovalent? You know, there shouldn't be, remember, for the immunosuppressed populations earlier prior to these new recommendations about booster, they did allow um, you, if you were immune suppressed or had a recommendation, to get a, a another booster if it's been at least two it's months. Three, it's three so, shots, and they were spread a month yeah. apart. And so, okay. yeah, we did that originally. So you should on. overall be okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't, there, so far, with all of the vaccine doses that have been given, there haven't been really any safety signals related to uh, um, getting doses, you know, fairly soon after one another, as long as provided it's it's probably two months or eight weeks or more. Okay. Yeah. Ju Julie has an interesting question. Julie wants to know, this is back to rashes. Can you look at a rash and gauge by the look of the rash how well someone's cancer treatment is going? Do the dermatological side effects correlate to cancer treatment response at all? Yeah, you kind of thought, you talked about that again, Dr. Cornelius, we hit on that, and we kind of go to wrap up after that, but yeah. But it, yeah, it depends. I, I, don't, I don't think we can say to what degree it's effective, but it gives you some insight as to if the drug is doing what it's supposed to do. So, for example, you're getting immunotherapy for melanoma, and you start losing pigment on your skin. Well, you know that your immune system is targeting your cells that produce pigment, so that gives you an idea that it's trying to do what it's supposed to do. But it's not always a guarantee, and I don't think we can gauge the degree to, of the effectivity. Uh, you know, here's the biggest question of the morning, Dr. Cardones. Neutrogena, Johnson & Johnson, mm -hmm. iodine, what's your, what's, your, what's your sunscreen of choice and what's your strength? 
I'm very, I'm very old school. I don't like fancy brands. I will say that. Um, I my favorite, you know, usually I recommend an SPF 30 or 50. Um, I like the physical sunblocks, uh, the non-chemical sunblocks. So it used to be if you wanted to get something with titanium or zinc in it, and those are the physical sunblocks, you had to get the opaque sunscreens or sun sunblocks. But now you can get them as transparent sunblocks. So I, what I usually say is 30 to 50. And the important thing is reapplying. If you're sweating or if it's been too long or if you've been in the water, you have to reapply your sunscreen because all of that has been washed away already. All right, Tamara, do you wear a sunscreen when you go outside now? Every day, it is part of my moisture putting on my face routine. Dr. Cardona's made sure to ingrain into me. I am now wearing sunscreen for the rest of my life. <laughs> Excellent plan. You know, I'm just kind of an old white guy. I have to wear it all the time. Oatmeal? People talk about oatmeal. Is that something you put on, you eat? What does that do for your skin? <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> we use it. We use it for, for its antipyretic properties. I know there are certain lotions that incorporate that. You know, I'm a big fan of the old school uh, non-toxic therapies that reduce uh, that reduce itching. So with Tamara, we, we had a lot of tricks that we tried to use to reduce the itching that were non-pharmacological. So what were those tricks? Simple things like putting your lotion in the refrigerator oh, uh, because oh, the cool, you're, you're fooling your nerves. If, you, if your skin feels cool, it forgets that it's itchy. Did you want to just put your whole body in the refrigerator? I bet Tamara, <laughs> you would have liked to have a total body refrigerator oh. at that point. It, if I could have fit in there, I would have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And so then you probably told her, only take cold baths, not hot baths. <laughs> no. Well, we don't want, we don't write extremes of temperatures. The extreme of anything is not good. Uh, it's not good. So you want, you don't want the hot, definitely not hot showers because that strips all the oils from your skin. Um, you're not supposed to be scrubbing your skin. I, I, you know, a lot of my patients are already plenty clean. They, they think they're overdoing their, their cleanliness regimen. You don't want to traumatize the skin. So just be very gentle with it. So gentle soaps. Gentle soaps. You don't have to soap every day. Um, <laughs> you paused on that one, so I guess you're thinking you should, because otherwise you may not, you it, know. It depends. It depends on the situation. Yeah. It depends on what you do. It depends on what activities you have. Yeah. Okay. You've got to keep those bacteria pretty healthy on the skin, too. Yes. Keep them balanced. All right. This has been a great discussion, and I'm grateful for all the guests. I kind of want to get to some final thoughts before we go. Tamara, first of all, what a delight it has been to have you on the program. And you are welcome back anytime. And we wish you Thank the very, you. very best with uh, the ongoing surveillance of your breast cancer. And hope you Thank hope you, you so much. The best. I greatly appreciate it. It was such a pleasure being here. And if you need me at any time, please feel free to reach out. All right. Well, thank you. What a pleasure. Dr. Cardonis, I can't imagine a nicer patient. Uh, I, have, I have the best patients. I am so lucky. Um, that makes my job. <laughs> you know, I, I, like I say, they, they do all the hard work. They're the ones who do all the heavy lifting. They're the ones who are going through this. Um, and so I'm so grateful for that. And so good to see you, Tamara. Thank you so much for joining us. The same with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cardonis. Final thoughts, Dr. Cardonis? Randy, yeah. Rambo, what do I say? I was, I was, I was going to work in that Rambo one time. I used to say, when I was a kid growing up, I used to say, my name is Bambi with an R, and then later on when I was older, I said, yeah, people understand it better when I say Rambo with an I. I know, well, that so. sounds like me. That, yeah. But I don't know, I'm not sure that's your image that you project. I don't think you project Sly Stallone to me. I don't know. I said, final thoughts. Well, you know, I'm, you know, I think, uh, I'm, thank you so much for inviting me and giving this opportunity to talk about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. And thank you for inviting my patient. Um, I do think, you know, that, you know, the skin, the skin is a very complex organ. Not all rashes are created equal. And, but we're here to help you sort that out. Thank you. And thank you for being on the program. And thanks for being here at the University of Kansas Health System. Final thoughts, Hawkeye. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll just continue to, to echo and endorse the, the prevention. You know, vaccines, uh, please talk with your, your medical providers. We had that question today. Uh, be up to date with your vaccines. And, of course, obviously for the skin, especially during this time of the year, vitally important to continue to use sunscreen and protect yourself uh, from those harmful UV rays. You know, um, one of the things I've I always enjoyed this program, one of the things I, I love is to watch a patient Tamara Edwards and a doctor, Dr. Angela uh, uh, Adela, uh, uh, Rambi Cardonis, sit and have a doctor-patient interaction around this show. It, it reminds us of what the best of medicine really is. It doesn't take place on television, and it doesn't take place in a, on the legislative floor when legislators try to talk about medicine. It takes place in the exam room between the physician and the patient and the team. 
that's when we are all at our best because we're trying to work toward one thing. We all have a similar goal in mind, and it doesn't matter what your political beliefs are, et cetera. It matters that you have two people or a team of people working together to take care of that patient. And that exam, that room, that, that room where you meet and you work together becomes the focus. And that work, I, I, I do believe it, it feels like God's work between all the team and all the people involved and all the good folks working and the patients when they work hard right there with you. That is the best of medicine. And that's when we really understand the true power of medicine. Hey, thanks to all our guests. And again, to all of our audience, remember, as we like to say in this program, faith, hope, and science, power of medicine. We'll see you next week. Coming up Friday on the Morning Medical Update. One mom never realized her four-year-old had a vision problem, and without treatment, it would have gotten much worse. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Morning Medical Update. A simple visit with the right experts can detect vision problems early and help kids see their bright futures. Friday at 8. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.